Some parents say it looks good at first, but a social curriculum being taught in Utah classrooms sends the wrong message. Now the Canyons District has a decision to make. Numerous victims rescued in a major human trafficking bust in Davis County. I doubt any of any of his neighbors would ever imagine that he was a sex trafficker, a human trafficker. New at 9, the shocking details and what we know about the man at the center of it all. Our first wave of rain moving through. How many more waves to follow? I'll let you know in the forecast. He didn't just die. He was murdered. He was killed by someone else with ill intent. Police say he was out on a morning walk when he was gunned down in this West Valley City neighborhood. The day before he was talking about how he was going to make it to 90. Why police want to find this man, plus the agonizing message from the victim's family. Live from Utah's news leader, Fox 13 News at 9 starts right now. Tonight, a homicide victim in West Valley City has been identified. Police say 82-year-old Farrell Bartke died yesterday morning, and tonight his killer is still on the loose. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bob Evans. And I'm Haley Higgins. And for Kelly Chapman tonight, Fox 13 Spencer Joseph joins us live from West Valley City, where police say they are looking for a person of interest in this senseless death. Spencer. Bob, Haley, you can imagine now just a day after the loss of their loved one, the family is heartbroken. I spoke with them this afternoon, and they say he was just out on his early morning walk when the unthinkable happened. Now, police have released the name Noel Munoz Lopez as that person of interest, and our Fox 13 team has been able to uncover this isn't the first time he's had run-ins with law enforcement. He's the type of person that cares about everyone and wants everyone to be happy and wants, wants to make you smile and he has those silly dad jokes. He's just, he's an amazing person. Lots of people in the West Valley community near 3800 South and 4200 West knew 82 year old Farrell Barkey. They knew his happiness, they knew his love of gardening, and they knew how he took his morning walks. And Monday was no different. He was just on a walk around the neighborhood and was shot and killed. His great granddaughter, Brianna, became emotional as she told us how much the family is grieving over this loss. People need to understand this is just an 82 year old man who was doing nothing more than going on a walk, who had no ill intentions in the neighborhood and had done this every day for months. He didn't just die, he was murdered. He was killed by someone else with ill intent. The victim in this case is an 82 year old. It just kind of it does it does just really bring it to that level where you um, just feel that really heightened uh, heartache over something like this happening. And West Valley City Police have been on the case since Monday and they have a lead. They have a person of interest in this case. Police are asking for the public's help in finding 34 year old Noel Munoz Lopez. Lopez has been in trouble with the law before. In 2006, he was charged with one count of attempted murder and three counts of aggravated assault, serving jail time and currently is on probation. We know that Mr. Lopez has some sort of an involvement in the crime that was committed here. To what extent that is, we don't know, and that's what we need to get to the bottom of. But for the family of Farrell Barkey, the damage has been done. It's like losing someone who's been there for you your whole life. He was murdered on a really important day for our family. Um, it was someone else's birthday who was a really young kid and he's not going to understand. But the day before he was talking about how he was going to make it to 90 and how he had cleaned up his life so much that he was healthier and that he was going to be better and that he was going to do such amazing things within the last little bit of his life. So if you know anything about the person who has done this to him, please reach out because it's affecting so many people beyond your scope and I hope that you all just reach inside your hearts and help us find him. That number to call 801-840-4000. Again, 801-840-4000. That number also on your screen right now. That will get you to the West Valley City Police Department. And they say anybody with any information whatsoever, call that number and report it to them. For now, live in West Valley City, Spencer Joseph, Fox 13 News, Utah. All right, thank you, Spencer. Well, tonight, a bountiful man is under arrest for human sex trafficking thanks to an undercover investigation by the Utah Attorney General's office. Fox 13 was the only station to join the task force as they arrested Michael Ricks this morning. Investigators were able to build the case after an alleged victim came forward saying that she was forced into sex trafficking. 
There were numerous possible victims living in two apartments in Salt Lake and Taylorsville. Investigators believe Ricks used drugs to control the victims. It literally crosses all boundaries. And, and just when you think that human trafficking doesn't occur in your state, in your city, in your neighborhood, I think this case is one of those cases that, you know, that makes you say, hmm, right? Uh, it is happening, and it's happening around me. Alleged evidence, including drugs, was uncovered in a bountiful storage unit and Rick's East Bench home, Fox 13 Scott McCain. We'll have the full story tomorrow on Live at 11 and Live at Noon. Chad Daybell is looking for a change of venue, and prosecutors are okay with that, partially. Daybell's attorney, John Pryor, asked that the trial be moved from Fremont County because of the extensive media coverage surrounding this case. Prosecutors have said they don't mind a partial change of venue, meaning the trial would be held in Fremont County, but the jurors would come from another county and be sequestered during the trial. The prejudice that's inherent when there is such media saturation to such an extent that everybody knows about the, 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 the case, everybody knows about what's going on in the case, and that uh, the very nature of that excessive and, and um, um, unrelenting publicity causes an inherent uh, prejudice for uh, a defendant to get a fair trial. Rexburg Police Chief Shane Terman doesn't want the trial moved. He says it would cost his department extra money, time, and manpower to have his officers travel farther to testify. It's not known when the judge plans to issue a ruling. Switching gears to weather now, it was a busy day in southern Utah. Zion National Park was just one of several areas that was under a flash flood warning. You can see some of that heavy rain came down the side of the cliffs in Zion this afternoon. Absolutely stunning, but very dangerous when that happened. Oh, yeah. I tell you what, Breck, that is just outstanding video. I love to see that, but boy, you got to stand back. You can't yeah. get caught in that. Nice to see from a distance, but concerns actually traveling through Zion National Park earlier on where they had flash flood warnings in effect. We warned you that that would be the potential, that flash flood potential across southern Utah. So we look at some of the rain amounts. Doesn't look like it's too heavy, but it fell in such a short period of time as it siphons through those narrow canyon areas. Yeah, you can see the results. We had similar situation up towards Bryce Canyon Canab, about a third of an inch of rain. Just east of Canab, there was a report though of a, uh, about an inch of rain as you move further east throughout south central Utah where we did have flash flood warnings in effect earlier on, but they've expired. The further north you go, the less rain we saw, but everyone getting in the mix today either with some light precipitation or heavy rain. Right now we turn towards southern Utah, still have some clouds in place, a few spotty showers just east of Bryce Canyon, potentially up near Capitol Reef. Pushing through northern Utah, things tapering off as well. We're holding on to just kind of a line of showers exiting the state. You see the flow from the south to the north. So for tonight, showers winding down. However, as we start things off on your Wednesday morning, yeah, we see a return of the rain. How long will it last and how many more storms as we look through the rest of the week? We'll take a look at that coming up in just a few minutes. Coming up on Fox 13 News at 9. Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendenhall wants to push pause on a new homeless shelter. Why and how homeless resource advocates are responding. The Utah 2020 crime report was released today. What increases it shows in violent crimes and property crimes coming up. Almost no one outside of Facebook knows what happens inside of Facebook. A whistleblower says Facebook needs to take responsibility. What more was said during her testimony before Congress and what part Utah Senator Mike Lee played. The youths will tell us how they hope football helps them heal, and the Cougars will tell us what it's like to be back in the top 10. The citizens really stepped forward and said there's a lot of good reasons not to do this. We really need to tap the brakes. Local businesses and homeless resource advocates reacting tonight after a plan to turn a detox facility into a homeless overflow shelter in the ballpark neighborhood was squashed. Fox 13's Lauren Steinbrecher explains what Mayor Aaron Mendenhall did to halt the proposal after the state had already approved it. In between the buzz of construction projects on 900 South, you'll see other projects completed by Atlas Architects within sight of their own office. It's been really exciting to be part of a neighborhood being created. 
you know, out in real time. And still developing in real time, but lately with controversy. After ballpark area community members found out the state approved a plan to purchase the VOA detox center and turn it into a homeless overflow shelter. Well, I think the detox center has been a good neighbor and nobody seems to have any problem with the detox center. But adding one more shelter to the neighborhood felt like um, for a neighborhood that's already at a tipping point that that would just set us on a path to no return, much like what they faced in the Rio Grande neighborhood with the road home shelter. The area already houses two resource centers, people have pointed out, and the VOA Youth Resource Center, which some worry will be too close to the proposed overflow shelter on Brooklyn Avenue. Following neighborhood outcry, Salt Lake City Mayor Erin Mendenhall announced Monday night in a community meeting she's halting everything for now. She signed a petition that prohibits any new shelters in the city for the next six months while Salt Lake City adjusts its zoning code so that we get an equitable distribution of shelters so that any one neighborhood isn't overly burdened with all of the services as we were on a course to have happen. That's what Jesse says the mayor told them. The city will now look at amending city ordinances when it comes to permanent and temporary overflow shelters and where shelters are allowed. We agree that more permanent shelter in the city is not a solution, wrote the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness in a statement to Fox 13. The coalition, which proposed the plan, added that it is considering several options for the detox facility, including as that dedicated temporary overflow site. Our ultimate goal, however, is to eliminate the need for temporary overflow shelter through statewide and substantial investment in deeply affordable and permanent supportive housing, they said. Hulse is happy the mayor pumped the brakes. He's not against a temporary shelter, just not here. It's got to be fair to all the neighborhoods of Salt Lake, not just the ballpark. The VOA says they had been planning to combine their admin offices along with their detox center in our larger facility, and now they'll meet with community stakeholders and community members as they figure out next steps. In Salt Lake City, Lauren Steinbrecher, Fox 13 News, Utah. The mayor's office says the petition doesn't stop the city from considering a potential temporary shelter location before that six months is up, but a provider must propose a site in a zone that currently permits homeless shelters. We're learning more about Brian Laundrie tonight from his sister. Laundrie is the person of interest in the murder of Gabby Petito. Today, Cassie Laundrie spoke to protesters outside her home in Florida. She shared details about the camping trip her family took with Brian in September. She says she was there for only a few hours eating dinner and dessert with Brian and their parents, and Gabby was not mentioned. Cassie was also asked questions about Brian's past relationships. Have you ever seen Brian hit Gabby? No. no. Have you ever seen him fight? No. Have you ever seen him hit any woman? He was no, with? I've never seen him be abusive or angry you, in anything. No. You. Brian's attorney revealed a series of solo flights that Brian was on to Florida on August 17th and then back to Utah on August 23rd, where he was supposed to rejoin Gabby. Laundry's parents still deny knowing where he is. It may be no surprise to some, but a new report shows that women working in Utah earn less than their male counterparts. But more remarkably, the report shows Utah is one of the worst places for the wage gap. The Utah Women in Leadership Project recently discovered that women in Utah earn up to 30 percent less than men in the same job, while the national average is 16 to 18 percent less pay for women. Project founder Dr. Stacy Madsen says the state of Utah is not doing enough. So the states that have made the most progress are states that have more discussions, more public policies, have major companies in the state stepping forward, talking about that, making changes and policies within their companies. Some researchers believe it could take anywhere between 40 and 130 years to close the gender pay gap. Let's get you ready as we look for the rest of the week. Of course, we had a couple of storms move through the state today, producing the rain heavy at times, especially across southern Utah. But now moving through the evening and by tomorrow morning, we're going to be looking at clear conditions. This is a photo taken right at sunset. Gorgeous shot there. I think this is in Toronto Golf Course. As you look 
off in the distance, that red light there, red at night, Sailor's Delight, at least across southern Utah, that moisture pushing away, but we've got a little different story here for northern Utah. Now the official high today in Salt Lake City, 81 degrees. We got those warmer temperatures into the early afternoon. Throughout the afternoon, though, we brought in those clouds, a few light rain showers along the Wasatch Front. On average, we should be in the low 70s. Record for today at 87 degrees. I think we're going to be saying goodbye to the 80s for a while here as we look for northern Utah. But we did make it up to 83 degrees today in Ogden. Upper 70s for highs in Logan. Looks like mid-70s for your official high there in Vernal. 80 degrees in St. George. Some cooler temperatures across the south because of the rain that you experience here, especially throughout the afternoon. Now we're still hanging on to the 60s here along the Wasatch Front. Winds out of the southeast. We've kind of seen that more persistent breeze here today as again, a series of storms continue to travel here throughout the state as we move ahead. Now for tomorrow, we're expecting to see more rain, slightly cooler temperatures, maybe even an isolated thunderstorm getting ready for a bigger storm, which will bring statewide precipitation as we look towards the end of the week into the weekend. Again, I'm hinting at a bigger storm next week, though, especially late Tuesday. Snow levels are dropping with that storm. We'll talk about that in just a few moments. Let's get you here and through the next 48 hours where, again, we still see some active weather holding on to some moisture, especially across central and southern Utah. Another wave of rain that's exiting the state. We've got these disturbances that will continue to track through. We've got the flow out of the south wind, uh, west pumping in the moisture. Another disturbance will keep some active weather going across northern Utah as we transition Wednesday into Thursday. Cool front though hits on Friday. That will bring again more widespread rainfall here across the state. And yes, I'm emphasizing rain. We're not concerned with snow as of yet, but let's take a look at our computer models as we get you ready for tonight and for tomorrow morning's commute. We will see some showers across southeastern Utah. Could be heavy at times as we look in areas such as Blanding and Monticello. And then as we look towards tomorrow morning, some rain to start the day. Southern end of the Wasatch Front through central Utah. So some wet roads potentially as we look through Utah County, moving up through Wasatch and Summit County as well. So traveling through uh, parleys for your morning commute could be a problem even as we look towards the point of the mountain up through Salt Lake Valley. Then that moves on afternoon. We could see some scattered rain showers, maybe even an isolated thunderstorm as we go through tomorrow. And then as we head into Thursday, still holding on a chance of some scattered showers for northern Utah getting ready for Friday. Now for tonight, we'll hold on to that chance of rain briefly, but it really gets going tomorrow morning there as we look towards the southern end of the Wasatch Front. Highs tomorrow, a little bit cooler. Again, the focus will be mainly across northern Utah where St. George, you get a break from the rain tomorrow through Thursday, some rain showers on Friday, clear through the weekend. Next week looks to be a little bit cooler, but your rain is just kind of going away until Friday. Northern Utah, we've got some scattered rain showers, isolated thunderstorm, more rain Friday into Saturday. Break Sunday, Monday, more rain on Tuesday. Again, a cooler storm Tuesday afternoon through Wednesday could bring snow down to the benches. We'll talk more about that, but at least for the next few days, expect the rain. All right, Breck, thanks so much. Still ahead, the push to bring the Olympics back to Utah is ramping up again. What one group has in mind to bring the games back to the Beehive State. New at nine, a fight brewing over a school curriculum, not critical race theory, but something called social emotional learning or SEL for short. It's a concept that focuses on developing skills such as stress management and relationship development. Tonight, the Canyon School District is deciding what to do with the curriculum from here. Fox 13's John Franke is at district headquarters in Sandy tonight. John. Well, guys, it is a very late night. Here's a live look at that boardroom. You can see the meeting is still going on right now. Now, last month, the district paused its social emotional learning curriculum. It was approved by this very board back in 2019, and that's why we're here tonight. Our children matter and what they're being taught in school matters. Lisa Logan is a parent of two students in the Canyon School District. She tells us she spent hours here at the district office reviewing how social emotional learning is presented in elementary and middle schools. Lesson by lesson, slide by slide, we looked at the teacher handout. 
This is the curriculum Lisa and others find problematic, the Second Step Social Emotional Learning Program. Its website says it aims to teach students how to gain confidence, set goals, make better decisions, collaborate with others, and navigate the world more effectively. When it's done with a political or ideological lens, um, it really is not healthy for our children. Lisa and another parent composed this 25-page document detailing underlying issues they believe are in the 8th grade SEL curriculum. Things like discussing racial and gender, power and privilege, and age and appropriate material on topics like relationships and sex. It goes really beyond pushing kids to be kind to people who are different than, than them and really to accept these ideologies and to act, uh, really be social justice activists for them. In late September, after concerns were raised, the district notified parents of Superintendent Rick Robbins' decision to place Second Step curriculum on hold. The notice said the second step curriculum, although supported by many, has links to information that may not meet the community's expectations and needs. The issue is put on the agenda for tonight's board meeting. I have not signed up for group therapy for issues my children most likely don't even have. But not every public comment was against the program. We need to teach problem solving. We need to teach empathy. We need to do that in combination with the family and the home. A packed room of parents and educators shared their opinions. Many spoke on the benefits of the program and expressed disappointment that it was paused. Do not completely eliminate the program because of links that can easily be removed. <laughs> you have an SEL curriculum already in place and it works. I'm very dedicated to supporting the social and emotional needs of our students as well as creating more equitable systems in our schools. The superintendent is proposing this plan for the district to move away from second step and develop its own SEL material with lessons like what are my values, building self-esteem, and am I empathetic? Lisa believes voices like hers and other parents opened up this discussion, but no matter where people stand on the issue, she hopes all are involved in the conversation. We teach them about goal setting. We teach them about um, how to treat others with kindness and uh, we should really have a say in how they're learning that at school. And we requested to speak with the district and we're told and actually refer to the comments the superintendent is making here tonight. But because public comment went so long, as you can see behind us here, the district is, is making that presentation with the superintendent right now on social emotional learning. We expect a vote to be taken by the board here later this evening. We, of course, keep you updated online with what they finally decide. Reporting live in Sandy tonight, John Franke, Fox 13 News, Utah. Coming up after the break. Some sharp increases in Utah's latest crime report, but some encouraging decreases. We'll show them to you. Utah Senator Mike Lee tackling Facebook head on in Washington following bombshell admissions from a whistleblower on national TV. Why he's claiming the social network is promoting harmful lifestyle choices for children across the country. It's a growing problem in rural Utah. Some communities are booming while others are languishing. It lies deep below Park City. Tonight, a look inside this historic place and why it's so vital for the people living above. Coming up, it's the Yankees and Red Sox in the wild card. Plus, we'll hear from the Utes and Cougar football teams. Department of Public Safety released its 2020 crime data today, and it shows some troubling increases. Fox 13's Brian Schneed takes an in-depth look at the numbers. This crime clock of 2020 criminal activity in Utah shows the annual ratio of crime to fixed time intervals. So basically, the relative frequency of these crimes taking place. Now, it ranges from days with one homicide roughly every three days or so, to hours with one motor vehicle theft almost hourly, to minutes with one larceny or theft of personal property almost every 10 minutes. Clearly, these numbers correlate to lives and real people impacted by these crimes. But Utah's Department of Public Safety says that despite the data behind this report, Utah as a whole remains a very safe state. Department of Public Safety's Bureau of Criminal Identification released the data Tuesday morning, which shows a lot of crime increase in certain categories. In 2020, more than 79,000 index crimes, an increase in roughly 6% of those crimes reported. Index crimes refer to homicide, rape, robbery, motor vehicle theft, arson, among other things. Utah's trends do match what happened nationwide. 
in just an unprecedented year. The data shows that homicides increased by 44 percent, but the rate of homicides per 100,000 people was less than half of the national rate. A lot of the states surrounding us um, saw similar increases, again, with the violent crime. Homicides was up um, a ton. Arson, a lot of states experienced similar things that Utah experienced during the times of civil unrest that led to these spikes. The only violent crime that decreased in 2020 were rapes, which decreased by nearly 10 percent. Arrests also decreased by nearly 20 percent, likely an effect of the pandemic. DPS says this data shows a true increase in reported crime, and it's not just due to a growing population. Commissioner Jess Anderson emphasized in the report that one year of data does not make a trend. He also addresses the safety of Utah and saying, Despite the numbers we reported today, Utah remains a very safe state. However, when it comes to property crimes, thefts in Utah were happening at a much higher rate than the rest of the United States. As a Utahn, you know, I care about this data because I live here, too. This is my community, my home state. Um, it is nice to know that while we have some of these increases, we are on trend with the nation. So Utah's not any like any less safe. So you might be asking, what's the point of this report? The information in this crime report is shared with local law enforcement agencies and legislators so they can make some informed decisions about trends across the state of Utah, as well as actions that they might be considering. You can view the entire crime report on our website, fox13now.com. Brian Schnee, Fox 13 News, Utah. New tonight, authorities in Utah County are looking for an Eagle Mountain teen reported missing by her mother. According to the Utah County Sheriff's Office, 17-year-old Morgan Danielle Sessions left her home in the middle of the night on September 21st. She left a note saying she was moving to St. George with friends, but police do not know if she got there. Deputies believe Sessions may be in either Utah County or Salt Lake County. If you know where she is, contact the Utah County Sheriff's Office. New opportunities are being offered to struggling families in Weber County. The Western Governors University has partnered with Weber County and celebrated a resolution today to support the more than 7,000 children affected by intergenerational poverty in Weber County. The program has the goal of helping families get off state assistance. Among other things, it offers them a scholarship for education and post-secondary certifications. When we talk to our active families and we've asked them what the program means to them, they've said that they never, ever considered enrolling in post-secondary, and now they have a chance to. The Western Governors uh, University in Weber County are hoping this won't just impact and empower individuals, but entire families. With the approval of the COVID-19 booster shot, many are wondering who can get it. Doctors at University of Utah Health helped answer those questions today. Boosters are available for people who have completed the previous two vaccine doses of Pfizer. The shot is particularly important for people who are aged 65 years and older, the age group at highest risk for infection. However, if you're older than 18 and have any compromising medical conditions, you can get the Pfizer booster shot too. And these are very broad. I mean, it's a uh, oh, being overweight, uh, that's not terribly obese, it's just overweight. Um, moderate to severe asthma, high blood pressure, any type of diabetes. I mean, if you think about it, this is the majority of the American population, unfortunately. Uh, so virtually everyone, particularly over the age of 50, who has any one of these conditions is eligible. Doctors at U of U Health say anyone over 18 who works in a high-risk job, such as healthcare, teachers, or in customer service, they would also be eligible for the booster. Still to come, Facebook is under the microscope once again as a whistleblower testifies before Congress about the social network strategies. But Utah Senator Mike Lee asked of the former Facebook employee today. The majority of young people on Instagram are having a good experience, and that is borne out by the documents that were stolen, including the Instagram youth survey of about 40 Instagram users. These were teens who were already struggling with mental health issues. 
You just heard from a spokesperson for Facebook responding to the testimony made by whistleblower Francis Haugen before Congress today. Haugen released tens of thousands of pages of internal research and documents indicating Facebook was aware of various problems caused by its apps. Now she claims the social media giant puts profits above almost everything else, including the well-being of your youth. Utah Senator Mike Lee was among those who grilled the whistleblower in Washington today. Fox 13's Eliana Sheriff picks up the story. Our witness this morning is Francis Haugen. Facebook under fire with data scientist and former Facebook employee Francis Haugen blowing the whistle on what she says are troubling tactics by the social media giant. The company's leadership knows how to make Facebook and Instagram safer but won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. Haugen testified Facebook took steps to combat misinformation in the run-up to the 2020 election, but afterward rolled those protections back. Facebook changed those safety defaults in the run-up to the election because they knew they were dangerous. And because they wanted that growth back, they wanted the acceleration of the platform back after the election, they, re they returned to their original defaults. And the fact that they had to, th to break the glass on January 6th and turn them back on, I think that's deeply problematic. Utah Senator Mike Lee focused much of his questions on the impact on youth, including advertisements. He pointed out recently Facebook's head of safety testified that Facebook doesn't allow ads for weight loss and tobacco to minors. Now, since that exchange happened, uh, a number of individuals and groups have indicated that that part of her testimony was inaccurate. Senator Lee showed a few mock-up ads by the Tech Transparency Project that would target 13 to 17-year-olds if a Approved. And as I understand it, oh, Facebook wow. approved them for an audience of up to 9.1 million users, all of whom were teens. Ads promoting drug use, eating disorders. An Anna tip. That is a tip specifically designed to encourage and promote anorexia. Just to be clear, TDP did not end up pushing the ads out after receiving Facebook's approval but it did in fact receive Facebook's approval. Senator Lee tweeted mid-hearing saying Facebook would like nothing more than for you to think this is all about censorship so Republicans and Democrats can go back to fighting each other. Don't take the bait. This is about fighting for our kids. Following the hearing, Senator Mike Lee appeared on Fox News Channel saying Facebook isn't being adequately vigilant to protect children. Senator Lee says he's introduced a bill called the Promise Act that would create liability for these companies if they fail to comply with their own professed content moderation policies. Eliana Sheriff, Fox 13 News, Utah. Sometimes some of these communities need investment, they need infrastructure, it's their right. The governor's cabinet here in Cedar City focused on rural Utah. Coming up in sports, we'll check in with the Utah and BYU football teams and the playoffs are underway in Major League Baseball. Did the Yankees or Red Sox survive the AL wildcard game? The highlights are on the way. It's a tunnel that most people in Park City don't even know exists, but provides a third of the drinking water in that area. Yeah, today the city offered residents a chance to get to know this important part of town. Park City Utilities workers have been restoring the historic Spiro Mine Tunnel and recently created a plaza at the entrance to educate people about the mine's critical place in Utah's history. The tunnel was dug 100 years ago. It was a great um, engineering and construction accomplishment back then, you know, with the technology they had available to them. And, and the fact that it's as straight as an arrow for three miles back um, is, is amazing. The 10 million gallons of water pulled from the mine's runoff every day is used for drinking water, irrigation, snow making, and more. But since the tunnel was used, the mine silver the city's public utilities work to make sure the water doesn't contain any harmful minerals. The Wasatch Front is wonderful, um, but it's not the only wonderful in the state. Rural Utah's pressing needs are the focus of a summit happening in Cedar City. Governor Spencer Cox and members of his cabinet were focusing specifically on rural issues today. Fox 13's Ben Winslow reports from Southern Utah University. From Logan to St. George, 
The governor's rural Utah summit has been rebranded to One Utah, focusing on Governor Cox's push for unity. The whole One Utah approach is to ensure every community, every individual has an equitable access to the resources that they want to be able to find the quality of life that they want to enjoy. But the summit still does focus on rural Utah, which hasn't seen the kinds of success and opportunity that the Wasatch Front has. Some communities are fi finding more success right now than they ever have, even on the tail ends of, of the pandemic, while others are so struggling. This summit is dealing largely with economic development and infrastructure. We know the, the difficulty of getting broadband into rural Utah. We're there was also plenty of discussion about technology start. and health care. Some rural political leaders say they welcome the state's attention to their community's needs. They're focusing more on rural Utah now than they have in the past, which is good, which is good. But they still struggle with allowing local com governments to have local control. The lieutenant governor says it may be more costly to help boost rural Utah, but it will pay off down the road. Sometimes some of these communities need investment, they need infrastructure, it's their right, um, it's, it's what they need to be able to uh, have uh, the same type of opportunities that the rest of us have, but it's often more expensive and we shouldn't let that uh, be an excuse to not act. Members of the governor's cabinet were here to update people on initiatives. The summit also works to connect rural communities with resources to help them grow. The state is also trying to lure companies to consider locating off the Wasatch Front. And now we're trying to incentivize people to actually go and move in these other places. R remote work has also provided another opportunity. Um, we've already put more uh, more than 100 state employees out in rural Utah in remote work uh, situations, and businesses can do that too. Now the legislature may be asked to spend some money for these rural specific initiatives. At Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Ben Winslow, Fox 13 News, Utah. The Salt Lake City, Utah Committee for the Games says their bid for the Olympic Games is ready. They just need to figure out which games they are applying for. Today, the committee laid out their bid in a virtual meeting. The proposal highlights Utah's Olympic venues that are still in use today. More than 24,000 hotel rooms in and around Salt Lake and the strong community and political support. Next week, they will be at the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee's headquarters in Colorado. This meeting will be to decide between bidding for the 2030 or 2034 Winter Games. With LA at 2028, we have to be very respectful of their games and how do we manage back-to-back -back games 18 months apart. But we have to balance our passion for an earlier games to the reality of hosting back-to-back -back games. And that has to be very, very carefully done. At the end of November, Utah and the United States will be sending a delegation to Europe to meet with the International Olympics Committee and present their intentions to bid. Well, as we speak of the Winter Olympics, of course, we showcase our great snow. And looking at the models long range towards next week, we got our hint of our first big winter storm, at least for the mountains. We'll talk about that in just a few moments. But today we got the rain, especially across southern Utah. Photo coming in from Kent highlighting the uh, beautiful fall colors towards southern Utah in contrast with that rain moving in as that storm system pushed further northward. We saw less precipitation though marking and making its move here across northern Utah. Now as we look across the state, we're still holding on to some rain showers A focus as we go from Bryce Canyon towards Capitol Reef, southeastern Utah, very light in nature. We look further southward though, we have a disturbance and heavy rain showers, even some thunderstorms that will make its move towards southeastern Utah in the overnight hours. So we're talking Monticello Blanding potentially up through Moab and then it tapers off by tomorrow morning. Now for northern Utah, we did have a line of showers now exiting the state, but we're not done. As we look at the computer models, I want to get you ready for your morning commute. So let's focus here across northern Utah. Got the clock just after midnight, but we wake up tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. Southern end of the Wasatch Front down through Nephi. Could see some rain and heavy showers as we look also up towards Wasatch Summit counties and pushing forward the northeast. We could see some rain, Spanish Fork Canyon. It may 
makes its move through Utah County, south end of the Salt Lake Valley through the mid morning hours. So wet weather through Parley's Canyon, especially as we go between 9 and 10 a.m. That moves on throughout the afternoon. Scattered rain showers and maybe even some thunderstorms for your afternoon commute north of Salt Lake City. So we go from the southern end of the Wasatch Front in the morning to the northern Wasatch Front for the afternoon. As we've got a couple of disturbances that need to make their move here across the state. Another one lining up that will keep active weather going at least for northern Utah through Thursday. A bigger storm and a cool front on track to reach us on Friday. So active weather continues on, but for southern Utah, looks like you'll get a break come tomorrow through Thursday, and then things improve. Well, we'll start to see that rain heading into Friday. But let me just show you this here. This is our snow model. This is what we're forecasting as we look at future snow, where over the weekend we could see snow in the higher elevations. Not a big concern. That next cold front will allow that snow to hit, but it's the next storm next week. It's Tuesday through Tuesday afternoon. Cold front, very cold that will drop temperatures where it looks like by Tuesday night we could see snow levels down to the benches and maybe even a few snowflakes from the mountains. Now the model is showing potentially a foot of snow again in the mountains and that'll be a great start here as we do and desperately need a good season of snow here for the upcoming winter. Now for tomorrow we're not thinking of snow, we're thinking of rain. Scattered showers across northern Utah, cooler temperatures as well. St. George, I mentioned the break you get Wednesday through Thursday. Rain on Friday, out of here by the weekend and we'll keep it clear with some cooler temperatures next week. Northern Utah is scattered rain showers, isolated thunderstorms tomorrow, Thursday as well. Some heavier rain on Friday lingering on into Saturday. Then that next storm hits Tuesday. Again, the colder air is Tuesday afternoon through Tuesday evening. We'll keep you updated there down into the 50s though Tuesday, but we get 70s here for the next couple of days. Utah will play a big game this Saturday at USC. In recent years, it's the game that determines who wins the Pac-12 South Division. This year's game will have a different feel to it, with the Utes still grieving the loss of teammate Aaron Lowe. But getting back to football has helped this team. The best way to heal and the best way to uh, get through this together is to get back to doing what we what they love, getting back to some sense of normalcy, but at the same time, you, know, you never put it out of your mind, but it's a therapy in and of itself, I guess you could say, getting back on the field. Having Aaron's mom come and talk to us and tell us to continue on because that's what he would want, that was kind of the, the last thing that we needed uh, before we could really do it. That helped because now you feel like you're going out here with a bigger purpose. We're more or less using this as a, you know, a fire up under us. We are in uh, Pac-12 play 1-0 uh, and, and we're going with intentions of going undefeated and you know that's that's where our minds at. We're going 1-0 on, on the week but you know whatever happens happens. The team's been through a lot and you know we're going to continue to push through. You can watch the Utes and Trojans play right here on Fox 13 this Saturday at 6 o'clock. Utah's played well against USC lately but the last time they beat them in the Coliseum was 1916. BYU has another big matchup this week when they host Boise State. Broncos are just 2-3 and three this season, but the Cougars expected their, expect their best shot Saturday. BYU has answered the call every week this season with five straight wins, including two over-ranked opponents. The Cougars have made a steady climb up the national polls this season. They're ranked 10th this week, but they're trying to stay grounded to keep their edge. One of those seasons where we need to stay hungry and you keep working. I mean, if, if everybody thought that we would be this, we would have been ranked number 10 preseason. There's still a lot of more opportunities for us to shock people. There's still more for us to do, so I think we've got to keep that edge. I feel like, for the most part, all of our boards are dialed in. Um, we don't really pay attention to any of that. It's really awesome, something we've been hoping for and we've been working hard for, but uh, we're grateful. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of work to do. It's awesome, though. Major League Baseball playoffs underway. Yankees, Red Sox in the American League wildcard game. Xander Bogarts gave Boston the early lead with his two-run home run in the first inning. Then in the third, more Boston. It's Kyle Schwarber. Gets good one on this one. Solo shot to right. Red Sox up 3-0. Boston is moving on with 6-2 win. They'll play Tampa Bay in the ALDS. We'll be right back. Finally tonight, Seinfeld fans are kind of upset about the show's recent move to Netflix. They say the aspect ratio in the Netflix version is cramping their experience. <laughs> show originally aired in a 4x3 format, as you might know, shot a long time ago. But the, it's now in the 16x9 widescreen edition, and the fans say 
the jokes and visual get you, they're getting cut out of the scene. He just zoomed it out, so you lose a lot of the. Well, zoomed it out. in actually, so well, you lose right, it. Yeah. I saw that. You tonight. can just watch Fox 13, and you'll see the whole thing. The whole thing right here. <laughs> Quick cast up next. <laughs> Coming up on the Fox 13 Quick Cast, what we're learning about the man killed in West Valley City yesterday. An alarming find in a local home leads to a human trafficking arrest. And some parents say the social emotional curriculum being used in Utah classrooms sends a bad message. Live from Utah's news leader, Fox 13's Quick Cast starts right now. The victim in a homicide in West Valley City has been identified as 82-year-old Farrell Bartke. Police are looking for 34-year-old Noel Munoz Lopez as a person of interest. He's been in trouble with the law before, served jail time, and is currently on probation. Tonight, the victim's family has a simple request. If you know anything about the person who has done this to him, please reach out because it's affecting so many people beyond your scope. And I hope that you all just reach inside your hearts and help us find him. If you know where Noel Munoz Lopez is, call West Valley Police at 801-840-4000. We now know who was killed in a shooting in West Jordan yesterday. Police say it was 16-year-old Jacob Jeremy Hansen. They arrested 19-year-old Cody Ivory. He's facing charges of homicide and aggravated robbery. Today, Michael Ricks of Bountiful was arrested on human trafficking charges during an undercover investigation by the Utah Attorney General's office. The AG's office says there were numerous victims living in two apartments in Salt Lake and Taylorsville. Investigators believe Ricks used drugs to control the victims. Just when you think that human trafficking doesn't occur in your state, in your city, in your neighborhood, I think this case is one of those cases that, you know, that makes you say, hmm, Right. Uh, it is happening and it's happening around me. Fox 13 News was with investigators when they served the warrants and made the arrest. Fox 13 will have the full story tomorrow on Live at 11 and Live at Noon. Well, we've got a series of storms that still need to track through the region, keeping active weather for tomorrow. The focus is across northern Utah with some rain showers, maybe even some thunderstorms. Now, waking up tomorrow morning, at least through Utah County, you've got the rain, which will impact your morning commute. But the northern Wasatch front throughout the afternoon as highs tomorrow a little bit cooler, close to where they should be for this time of year. Southern Utah looks like you're going to see mostly clear conditions. Sunny skies in St. George, a few clouds on Thursday. A storm on Friday bringing rain statewide, but for Southern Utah, clears out nicely for the weekend. Cooler temperatures next week, though. For Northern Utah, the rain continues on. Another disturbance on Thursday will keep showers at least on and off, and then Friday the rain hits, lingering on into Saturday. Then a break, another bigger, colder storm Tuesday bringing rain, and Tuesday night potential of snow down to the benches as we'll see temperatures cooling off but for the weekend we're in the 50s and 60s tonight the fight over social emotional learning in the canyon school district is heating up last month the district paused its social emotional learning curriculum which was approved by the board in 2019 some parents find the program troubling the district's website said it's supposed to teach students how to gain confidence set goals make better decisions collaborate with others others and navigate the world more effectively I have not signed up for group therapy for issues my children most likely don't even have. We need to teach problem solving. We need to teach empathy. We need to do that in combination with the family and the home. The board plans to announce a decision on the curriculum tonight. Tune in to Fox 13 D Good Day Utah for the latest. Salt Lake City Mayor Mendenhall has placed plans to turn a Volunteers of America detox facility in a ballpark neighborhood into a homeless overflow shelter on hold. The mayor signed a petition prohibiting any new permanent shelters in the city for the next, next six months. So the city can look at zoning ordinances in relation to temporary and permanent shelters. While Salt Lake City adjusts its zoning code, so that we get an equitable distribution of shelters so that any one neighborhood isn't overly burdened with all of the services as we were on a course to have happen. The VOA is a part of the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness, which made the proposal and they plan to reevaluate options based on community conversations. Some of the changes in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints associated with the COVID-19 pandemic 
maybe permanent. At the governor's One Utah Summit today, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said some church meetings will continue to be held on Zoom and others will use a hybrid of online and face-to-face. -face. Also, missionaries will be adapting technology and social media into their daily routine. Well, that's Fox 13 Quick Cast, today's top stories in just five minutes. Don't go anywhere. Modern Family starts now.